This message was presented at the GYC 2014 conference at the Cross in Phoenix, Arizona. For other resources like this, visit us online at www.gycweb.org. All right. Good morning. Morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, well, welcome to GYC. Those of you, it's your first time. Uh, anybody here for the first time to GYC? Wow. Praise the Lord. All right. Anybody here for the 10th time? Oh, wow. You've joined me. So this is actually my 11th or 12th, but I don't want to give away my age. So just know I didn't pay the $100 surcharge. So anyway, um, I just want to uh, welcome you all to our seminar this morning uh, for the next two days. Um, my intention is to take us upon a journey in looking at the cross in a different way than we typically look at it, which is predominantly for theological benefit. To say that this is what Jesus did for us, he died for me, or, you know, this is the implications in terms of the sanctuary, or the impact that this has upon the great controversy. Um, all of those things are very important, and we should pursue them theologically. But my intention in this seminar is to do what, we, what I've entitled it, which is a cross-check. And when you cross-check something, you kind of go back and you compare different things to see, like, wait a minute, did I miss a detail that I didn't catch before? Or maybe I realized that this person was actually there at the same time in the same place, and this is oftentimes how police catch criminals who thought that they slipped under the radar. And in the same sense, this seminar is not so much to implicate you and myself as criminals, as much as it is to say there's a story that is being told. And that story is your life. And that story at one point was Jesus's life. And his story ended in a very tragic way. At least it seemed on the surface. And what we discover is that just like Jesus found his story in the stories of others, that in the same sense, our story can be found in Jesus's story. In fact, not only can it be found there, but we find that your story, my story, Christ's story is a tale that has already been told. And that is my goal in these six sessions, is to show us that much of the things that we experience in life, much of what Jesus experienced, particularly around the crucifixion, is a tale that's already been told. And we're going to find, I believe, by God's grace and through the leading of his Holy Spirit, that that tale is being told again in you. And our goal then as Christians, when we talk about uplifting the cross, when we talk about sharing the cross, it is to help others to also find their personal story in the cross. And so with that being said, I'd like to pray to begin. And then we will immediately dive into our topic. We only have 50 minutes this is abuse to a preacher, but nevertheless, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> so let us pray together as we begin. Mighty God, everlasting Father, what an amazing privilege to be able to have the space, the time, the word and the spirit to be here right now, to study that which we will continue to study through eternal ages. It is our prayer, Lord, that as we re-examine the details, as we re-examine the general principles, as we re-examine the big story, the big picture, Father, that you will help us to find our story in Jesus' story. We thank you for what you will do. We thank you for your promise to speak to us if we would come to you in humility and with openness of heart and mind. Grant us this request, not for our sake or because of our own righteousness, but for your mercy's sake is our prayer in Jesus' name that all of God's people say, Amen. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. I hope you brought your Bibles. We're going to use them. GYC is not a place for smartphones. Just kidding. 
But I do like the physical Bible. I, I, I don't know. I feel uncomfortable without it. Matthew chapter 23. When you're there, you could say amen. Okay. If you're not there, just say have mercy. Okay. Matthew chapter 23. We're going to begin in verse 32. Matthew 23. In verse 32. Are we there? Amen. Amen. All right. The Bible says the words of Christ in red. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. I want to talk to you about archetypes. What word did I say? Archetypes. Now, the word archetype is a technical word in certain fields. It is a word that is used in behavioral psychology. It is a word that is used in terms of analyzing literature. And it's also a word that is used even in other areas that I don't want to get into, which are of no interest and use to us at this time. But an archetype, in a very simple definition, is a constantly recurring pattern in life or in literature. Now, the word archetype comes from two Greek words. How many? Two. The first one is arche. Maybe you know this word because of the archangel, right? So we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, and it says, And he will come with the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the archangel. The word arch meaning first or the ruler. But now the second part of it, the type or what we call in Greek, the tupon, is the model or the pattern. And... That's the noun form. The adjective is archetupos, which basically means this is the first model or the first pattern. This is the principal pattern from which all others are copied. You see, an archetype are the things that stories are made of. When you think of an archetype, I want you to think in your mind of Superman. Think of the fact that there's a hero and there's a villain, right? And this is the archetype that the hero is always perfectly good, right? He's so loving, he's so patient, he's always willing to sacrifice, or she, women can be heroes too, amen? Amen. And so, you have the fact that this is who they are. And then there's the villain, right? He's perfectly evil, always bent on destruction, always bent on selfishness, or greed, or power. At any cost, there is nothing he is not willing to do to accomplish his end. He is the arch villain. So now, this is what we call an archetype in terms of the, the, the characters. There's a hero, there's a villain, there's the trickster, there's the outcast, right? The person that doesn't fit in, but they're like the diamond in the rough. No one ever knew that they were actually the coolest person in school, but no one just ever knew about them. And then, guess what? We graduate from high school, go to college, and now she's the prettiest girl at the University of Maryland. And we're all thinking, man, why was I so mean to her in high school? That's an archetype in terms of characters. There's also archetypes in terms of images. The the concept of light versus darkness. That's an archetype. This is what we make. So we automatically assume, right, darkness is associated with evil, right, the bad. And light is associated with the good, the righteous, the holy. And this is also used in the Bible as well. If you look at the Gospel of John, you'll notice that a lot of things happen at night and some things happen in the light. And that by the end of the Gospel, some interesting things take place at the cross in terms of that merging of those two things. The last one is in terms of the plot or the story itself. Oftentimes, one of the most famous archetypes in terms of stories is the quest. Right. This is the Odyssey, the Aeneid, Don Quixote. Right. They're on this particular journey to save his bride or to reach some buried treasure or to be able to find his way home. Whatever the case is, this is the typical archetype. This is the stuff that stories are made of. 
So in behavioral psychology, Carl Jung applied this and he says, you know, there's also archetypes in terms of life, human experience. Maybe you've all taken a personality test before. You guys ever done that? And then you get the four letters, right? I-N-T-J, E-N-T-P or whatever it is. And you're like, oh, yeah, you're the analyst. You're the teacher, right? We start boxing each other. And then we say, oh, you're introverted. You're extroverted. This is an archetype. He has volumes of books about this. And people continue to say, behaviorally, based on how you answer certain questions, you fit into a certain archetype. You're just a copy of another model. Right? Your story is a tale that's already been told. And so Jesus looks at the Pharisees in his last plea before they are about to kill him. And he says in verse 32, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. I want you to almost see that Jesus is challenging them. But Jesus is also laying open to them that I know what you are doing. And the fact that what you are doing to me, what you are planning, the hatred, the envy that's in your heart, this is a tale that's already been told. Your fathers committed the same things. They had the same spirit. But here's a question. How can I fill up my father's guilt? The Bible says in Ezekiel 18 that the wicked man shall perish for his own sin. No one's going to die and perish for the sin of another person. So he says... Therefore, if you sin, you bear your own sin, your own guilt. He sins, he bears his own sin, his own guilt. But Jesus says, there's something in you that is the same. And he goes down and he tells us even particular stories. He says in verse 35, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the righteous Abel. Was Abel's blood shed? Yes or no? Yes, it was. Was he righteous? Yes, he was. Jesus even says he was righteous. So Christ says, all the way back to Abel, he says, all the guilt and all the blood. That means when the blood comes upon you, that means you are the one that is going to bear the responsibility. Do you remember the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20 when he was leaving the elders at Ephesus and he says, I am free from the blood of all men. Do you understand what he means by that? I'm not, if you die, it's not my fault. But if the blood is upon you, that means it is your fault. And Jesus looks at them and says, what is in you is this prime evil that has been brewing since the dawn of time. Since there was a brother and a sister upon the earth, that same thing that was in Cain is in you. The same thing that was in Joseph's brothers is in you. The same thing that was in Ahab is in you. And he says, what is about to take place on this city, on this hill, in this country is a tale that has already been told. This is just an archetype. This is a copy that other situations begin to come from. And you realize that if you look at it for what it is, you will realize that I understand this story. I know how this story ends. I know how the story goes. Have you ever had that experience before? You know, I remember as a person that travels a lot, I, my luggage is normally lot, not lost. In my 11 years of traveling, I think I lost my luggage twice until this year. This year alone has surpassed all the other times that my luggage has been lost. And so I was surprised that the first time it happened, I said, oh, you know, this is, you know, it happens every once in a while. They said, no problem, we'll deliver your bag. Everything was fine. The second time, as I arrived back from Nairobi, Kenya, into the States, and I arrived at the desk and I heard the name, oh, can Sebastian Braxton please approach the podium? So now I come to the desk and I'm like, oh yeah, this is a story that I've heard before. And I walked up to the desk and I said, please don't tell me my luggage is, they said, lost, it's lost. They said, not only is it lost, we don't even know where it is. I said, okay, that's interesting because you had it. And now you don't know where it is. And they said, we're sorry, sir. I said, I know, I know, right? You're, you're going to give me a ticket. Tell me to give you an address. Here's the number. And the lady said, you've been through this before, huh? 
Yes, this is a tale that has already been told. I know this story. Then I went to Cambodia, came back from Cambodia, Cambodia to England, to London. And as I arrived in London, and sure enough, Mr. Braxton, can you approach the podium? I know this story. I know how this is going to go. I know how this is going to end. And when we experience certain things in life, this is how we plan our lives. Am I not telling the truth? You know when not to go back to certain restaurants because you're like, I know this story. I'm not going to go through this again. You know which mechanic to go to because you're like, I'm not going to go through this again. This is a tale that has already been told. And so Jesus says, what is taking place at the crucifixion is not a new story. It is an old, old story. All the way back to Abel. I want you to notice, go with me to 1 John chapter 3. As we kind of build upon this concept. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 10. Are you there? All right. The Bible says <laughs> in verse 10, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. John tells us this is the reason why a brother killed his brother. This is the reason why he says his brothers were righteous. And his were evil. Therefore, he killed him. And if you look at the Genesis account in Genesis chapter 4, seven times the passage reminds you that they are brothers. Seven times. Now, why is it that Moses is emphasizing their relationship? That they are brothers. Because he's trying to get to the fact that when the question comes, am I my brother's keeper? Then you're thinking... This is emphasizing the fact, this is your brother, this is your brother, this is your brother, this is your brother, kills him. And then you look at the story of Jesus, and you say, well, if Abel's blood in his shedding is commensurate to the experience of Jesus on the cross, then I have to ask myself this question, was Jesus a brother? Yes, he was. He was a Jew. It was not the Romans that were thirsty for the blood of Christ. It was not the pagans, it was not the Greeks, it was the Jews. And you find that here is a brother killing his brother. And why is he killing his brother? Well, if Jesus says this is a story that's already been told, he says he's killing his brother because his brother's works are righteous and his are evil. You see, the story of the cross is about someone that decides to go to work and do the right thing, and that shows and magnifies the fact that other people are not doing the right thing. It's a tale that's already been told. The story of the cross is about a sibling rivalry. Where because you decide to do the right thing, you decide to go to college, you decide to keep yourself pure until you get married, that your brother, your sister, all of a sudden cannot take this. Looking for reasons to catch you in a mistake. Looking for reasons to show you're not so goody two-shoes as the parents think you are. Looking for you to make a mistake. Waiting for you to fall. Waiting for you to fail. Waiting for you to be embarrassed. Waiting for you to meet shame. This is the story. A tale that has already been told. And he says, Abel's blood was shed for this reason. And why is Jesus' blood being shed? Christ tells you. I already told you in Genesis 4. This is a tale that's already been told. I know in this room, there are people here that don't get along with their siblings. There are people here who, 
for some reason, after years and years, we're just not close to our sisters. We're just not close to our brothers. And we may not know why. But you see, it doesn't always have to be your blood brother or your blood sister. It can also be church members. Your brother and your sister. And for some reason, you know, we just decide to sit on this side of the church. They sit on that side of the church. It is a tale that has already been told. But you see, they don't really shed your blood, right? They just assassinate your character. So when your name comes up for nominating committee, when your name is being discussed to do something, and oh no, not that brother, not that sister. You know, I remember I, I, I saw her with someone, you know, in the streets, and they were doing some things that, you know, I really don't want to repeat here for the board. Well, what exactly were they doing? I don't think it's appropriate. You know, I'm not going to get into gossip. And you're like, so you want us not to vote this person for a theoretical mistake? Well, I really believe that, you know, there's some questions that need to be asked. And I don't know if we want to rush into this. A tale that has already been told. Sometimes even in families. It's not just brothers and sisters. Sometimes it's parents and children. We say, yeah, this is a story that's already been told at the cross. You say, why? Simply because you're doing the right thing. Do you know how many mothers have kids out of wedlock? They grow up and their kids decide, you know, her daughter decides, I'm not going to have any kids until I get married. I'm not just going to marry him because I'm in love with him. And so the mother just can't understand why the daughter says, listen, that guy's a nice guy. Why don't you just marry him? No, no, he's not spiritual enough for me. And so the mother continues to put pressure on her daughter. What's wrong with this guy? You're too picky. You're too choosy. You're a prude. And looking down at the situation and the girl is thinking, I wish I had the courage to look at my mother in the eye and say, I don't want your life. I don't want to end up like you. That's not what I want for my life. And you find the same story being told. Why? Because yours are righteous and your mother's were evil. And so she wants to remind you that you're not as spiritual as you think you are. I raised you. I know who you are. I know the crazy stuff you've done. I've changed your dirty diapers. So don't try to come in here holier than thou like you're trying to follow Jesus now. That you're trying to do things the right way. And it goes for young men too. I'm not going to be what my father was. I am not my father's mistakes. And some fathers cannot handle the fact that their sons are not interested in three girlfriends. They're not interested in multiple babies from multiple women. They're not interested in stepping out of their marriage. They want to be faithful. I want to be able to look at my daughter and her to know on her wedding day that my dad wasn't just a preacher. He wasn't just a spiritual leader. He was also faithful to my mom. So I can have confidence that I, if I marry a man of God, he can be faithful as well. A story that has already been told. And so if a parent comes down and says, well, I don't think you have to do all that. You're being a little extreme. You're a fanatic. No, my works are righteous and yours are evil. You need to come down and admit that what you did was a mistake. Not worthy to be repeated. A tale that's already been told. So in looking at your own personal story in the cross, you think this is just about a Jewish man being killed by his peers because they're mad that he took all the crowd after him. That's not the story. As soon as we look at this, and I'm just unable, I haven't even gone to the next people on the list. And you're saying, have I found my personal story at the cross? So now when I understand in this moment... And I see what Jesus is going through. This is a story that's already been told. 
And when I look at what I'm going through, I can find courage. I can learn how to respond the way Jesus responded when his were righteous and his brothers were evil. But then you go to Joseph and you thought maybe Abel and Cain was just a unique situation. No, it wasn't. Because Joseph was sold by his own brothers for pieces of silver. Why? Because the father favored him. Because the father blessed him. Do you know some people that are just not always happy with your blessings? No Pharisee was healing the blind. No scribe was resurrecting the dead. No hypocrite was raising the widow of Nain's son in the middle of the funeral. It was Jesus that God was blessing with that ability. And the Pharisees, of course, didn't like it, just like Joseph's brothers. A tale that has already been told. And to know that their own hatred of their brother, their own desire to see him in anguish, to sell him into slavery, into bondage to Gentiles, to treat him however they pleased, not knowing that the very means of their hatred was actually testing and growing the faith of their brother. It was making Joseph from a boy into a man. The very means of their hatred was leading to God's plan to exalt him. So how did he become second in command of Egypt? How was he sitting on the right hand of power? Because you hated me. Because you sold me. But you see, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. A tale that has already been told. So here these men think, we hate Christ. Crucify him. Crucify him. Away with this man. We want Barabbas. So as they sell Jesus, as he's hauled from false trial to false trial, beaten and hung upon a cross, not recognizing that their very means of hating him was actually exalting Christ. Jesus was not losing. Jesus was winning. And it was because... Jesus would sit upon that cross that he would eventually be raised to the right hand of God. And that's why Christ looked at them before they killed him. And he says, soon you will see the son of man coming on the right hand of power. Because Christ knew this story is a tale that's already been told. How many times has someone hated us, betrayed us? Worked against us because of envy, but somehow God turned it around to exalt us. It's a tale that's already been told. I remember thinking, as you understand this story, and saying, do I understand what it's like to suffer innocently? Do I understand what it's like that the people you think are closest to you, the people you love the most, that they would actually pursue your destruction. That they would actually seek to pull you down. To glory in your failures. To laugh in your pain and to say, hey, every dog has his day. Only to find out that what they had meant for evil, God had used it for good. Listen, I remember when it was time. For me to make a decision as a young Christian. Either you're going to follow Jesus or you're not. And when that decision came that this is what I was going to do. I remember that my stepmother was not very supportive of that decision. And I remember she called me one time and I said, you know, I'm not doing the movie thing anymore. I'm not going to the theater anymore. I'm not interested in that. And I got a phone call one time to pick up my three youngest siblings. And she said, hey, I can't make it, so you need to go take them to the movies. And I said, I'm not taking them to the movies. I said, well, you know, we don't have to get into this. You know, I'm your parent. The whole nine, I'm going to keep it Christian because I wasn't a Christian. I was barely a Christian at that time. So I'm not going to give you the full conversation. But suffice it to say, 
Here I am being pushed by my own parent to violate my conscience, and I just started having a conscience. So I said, you know what? I'm not taking them. So I came home, and I remember my father, right, came in, and my stepmother said, listen, well, no phone, no this, no friends over, all this stuff, right? So I, you know, I was getting this situation in my hands because... I wanted to stick to my own values. So I remember thinking, like, here I am, you know, suffering this particular occasion of what I consider to be injustice. And I said, so you're going to punish me because I don't want to take them to see a movie? I said, man, I wonder what are the struggles of parents in other homes? Oh, you know, pray for my son. You know, you think you have it bad. My son won't even take his siblings to see a movie. Oh, right. That's all you're dealing with? My son is struggling with cocaine. With meth. Marijuana. You're talking about taking people to movies? I wish I had that problem. And I remember as I was suffering in this situation, I was angry, I was frustrated. Then my father came home. And as they began to have this conversation, my dad looked at my stepmother and said, listen, if he doesn't feel comfortable doing that because of his own values and his own commitments, you can't force him to do that. And if anything, my dad looked at me and he said, you know, I respect the fact that you would hold strong to your own values because you're not a boy. You're a man. And if those are your values, people must respect them. And if they don't respect them, you make them respect them. And so he says, you have no problem in my book. You're free to go. Do whatever you need to do. Because now, because of your values, I know I can trust you. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. A tale that's already been told. You go to the soldiers, make sure I don't go over my time. You go to the soldiers who are crucifying Christ, who actually heard Jesus being declared as an innocent man. They heard Pilate say, I find no fault in this man. I find no fault in this man. When the Jews said, crucify him, crucify him, Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? And they said, no, away with this man. And then they heard Pilate say, fine. And willing to content the crowd, he delivered Jesus to them. So can you imagine, you are a soldier. You heard the governor tell you, this man is innocent. And he tells you, go kill this man. What do you do? They decide, you know what? I'm a soldier. I'm not here to decide whether people are innocent and guilty. I'm here to nail them to crosses. I'm just doing my job. I'm just following orders. And so you think this is a new story. This is not a new story. This is a tale that has already been told. Because when you go to modern day times, how many people are violating principles of the word of God because they're just doing their job? You think it's okay to lie to make a sale? It's okay to kind of give someone a half-truth. At least they're buying a good product. I'm making my quota. I'm getting my commission. Just doing my job. A tale that has already been told. Oh, you know, they told me that I have to take my exam on Sabbath. A tale that's already been told. You take an exam on Sabbath, you were there. When they crucified my Lord. Because you would have nailed him. Because you're just doing your job. Because you're just following orders. This is not a new story. When you go back to the genocide in Cambodia, in Rwanda. And you ask yourself the question, how is it that you can convince people to kill another person because they're of a different tribe? And they had no hatred of them. And the person would sit and say, well, they told us this is what we're supposed to do. So I'm just following orders. 
Or you go to Nazi Germany, the same thing. They say, well, it was the law. If you see a Jew, you have to arrest him. Steal all his property. Why? I'm just obeying orders. I'm just following the law. To the degree that when the men were brought before the International Justice Tribunal, and they asked these people, being tried for war crimes, did you or did you not put Jews in an oven? Did you or did you not starve young German children? He said, yes, but they were Jewish. And what made you think that was right? And the men's response was, I broke no laws. I broke no laws. It's a tale that's already been told. So you and I may think when we look at the cross that this is just about someone dying from my sins. But this is more than that, brothers and sisters. This is about our personal stories. Because everyone at this crucifixion scene had a personal story. The, the soldier didn't just wake up and decide, I'm going to kill the king of heaven today. On the agenda, to-do list. He just thought when he kissed his wife, when he hugged his children, he was just going to work. His job is to protect the governor and execute his orders. But little did he know that this day when he decided to check out, not to think for himself, not to come with any values or principles and say, you know what, even though they said he's innocent, I'm still going to kill him. That you could actually look Jesus in the eye, not even as God, but just as a man. And nail him to a cross, knowing that he's innocent. What would compel a human being to do that? Just following orders. Just doing my job. Do you know how many times church boards sit and they say, well, she got pregnant out of wedlock. The church manual says this should be the result of your decision. She needs to be disfellowship. And people are like, well, how are we going to win her back then? That's not even discussed. The point is, as a church, we're supposed to execute discipline. When a person makes a mistake, when they violate your rules, there must be consequences. And I'm all for that. There's plenty of churches that don't do discipline that need to. But many of those that do exercise church discipline, it is not redemptive. People are just doing it because the manual says it. Not because they love the soul. Not because they're trying to redeem the person. So the girl gets pregnant, disfellowship her, and no one visits her. They won't even pick her up to bring her to church. Won't bring her to prayer meeting. She feels uncomfortable even coming around the church. I would be too. And you're thinking, how many women, pregnant, outside of marriage, in the church, are spawned? And all people are thinking, my son can marry anybody, just not her. Because, you know, she's damaged goods. Really, that's how we treat souls, right? You know what our response is? Just following orders. That's, that's what the manual says. That's what we should be doing. But what happened to being people of principle? But like the soldiers, they teach us that this tale has already been told. This is an old, old story. I want to come to one last person. Barabbas. I want you to go with me to Mark chapter 15. As we continue in our meditation and reflection on these tales that have already been told. Mark.
Mark chapter 15. Are you there? The Bible says in verse 6. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them. Whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude crying aloud began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them saying, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them. And he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. I want to read to you something from Desire of Ages that I think you will find to be interesting. Page 733, paragraph 1. It says, The Roman authorities at this time held a prisoner named Barabbas, who was under sentence of death. This man had claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed authority to establish a different order of things, to set the world aright. Under satanic delusion, he claimed that whatever he could obtain by theft and robbery was his own. He had done wonderful things through satanic agencies. He had gained a following among the people and had excited sedition against the Roman government under cover of religious enthusiasm. He was a hardened and desperate villain, bent on rebellion and and cruelty. By giving the people a choice between this man and the innocent Savior, (laughs) Pilate thought to arouse them to a sense of justice. He hoped to gain their sympathy for Jesus in opposition to the priests and rulers. And so turning to the crowd, he said with great earnestness, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? You see, there's two points we have to make here. The first one is, is that Pilate thought this guy is so bad. This guy has gone so crazy into rebellion, into murder, killing people. He's even claimed to be the Messiah. His name, Barabbas, means son of the father. So now, as he goes, he says, well, here's the son of the father who's claiming to be the Messiah, but he's murdering in rebellion, in hatred, in cruelty. And on the other side, you have Jesus, who's claiming to be the son of the father. And as he's claiming to be the son of the father, he's healed. He's opened the eyes of the blind. He's fed 5,000, 4,000. He's walked on water. He saved the man from drowning. Should I continue? So all you're thinking as Pilate is, this is such an easy and obvious decision. But you see, this is a tale that has already been told. Do you know what we do when we try to get people to make the right decision? So we say, you know, you're looking at a friend and they're like, well, you know, I'm interested in this guy and I'm interested in that guy. And there you are as a friend, right? Like Pilate. Well, I mean, who do you want to pursue? I mean, Barabbas? (laughs) This guy has dated like five, ten other girls. You know, he's, he doesn't really, he's not really spiritual. He doesn't really love God. And you're hoping, right, that as the situation is set clear, that you would arouse her to a sense of justice. That you would arouse her to a sense of principle and of values. But does that happen? No, it's a tale. That has already been told. 
We think choosing Barabbas was the most ridiculous thing. But how many of us have friends, even ourselves? When it comes to dating, we chose Barabbas. And we're still licking our wounds for it. Some of us lost our innocence because we chose Barabbas. Some of us are afraid to even commit to another relationship because we chose Barabbas. It's a tale that has already been told. And we try to be like Pilate, like, oh, rather than telling them, if you choose Barabbas, you are stupid. <laughs> no, we want to tell them, hey, listen, look at this person. And this person, he loves God. He volunteers with GYC. He's a good looking Seventh day Adventist young man. He actually keeps the Sabbath. And yet you find that your friends choose the guy, choose the girl that is absolutely wrong. And Barabbas goes free. You say, this is a tale that's already been told. But even further than this, you find that Barabbas is a man that when he was released, I want you to think about this for a moment. It just struck me the other day in preparing for this seminar. When Barabbas was let go out of those chains, after he was released, Everything that happens from this point onward was meant for him. I want you to think about that for a second. As soon as he's released and Jesus is scourged with the cat of nine tails, digging into the flesh of his back, Barabbas is looking and thinking, that was supposed to be my back. And when he's after being whipped and dragged with the crowd, cursing him, Spitting in his face, that was supposed to be my spit. That was supposed to be my smack to the face. That should have been my face. Only to be taken to the place of crucifixion. And as the nails enter the hand of Jesus, Barabbas is saying, that was supposed to be my hands. And then when the cross is jolted into the hole, and the wounds are only further lacerated, He's thinking that was supposed to be me. Everything that Christ suffered, he suffered in Barabbas' place. A tale that has already been told. If there's anyone that we should identify with, it is Barabbas. Because the crowd's choice is God's choice. I'm going to say that again. The crowd's choice is God's choice. God looks down and he says, who do I choose? And death says, you have one choice. Either you get Jesus or you get Sebastian. A man wanted for sedition and rebellion in the kingdom of God, who has not kept your law, even for murder. And then he looks down and says, well, I want Sebastian. You can crucify Jesus. This is a tale that is already Your story and my story is the fact that we should have been there. That should have been us. So you know what this does for us in our experiences, in our stories. What it does for us is it tells us, it says, you know what? When I do suffer, when I'm under pain, when I'm under discouragement, when I'm going through difficulties that I myself am trying to understand... I can't sit up there and say I don't deserve it because Barabbas' friend was crucified right next to Jesus. And that thief heard the whole thing. And he started off cursing Jesus, mocking him, but then something came home to his heart. Something reached his mind where he said, wait a minute, Barabbas is free. We were rolling with Barabbas. Now Barabbas is out there and I'm hanging on a cross. 
Look who I chose to follow. Look who I chose to build my life and my pattern after. And I thought this man, Barabbas, was potentially the Messiah. The man who would create a new order of things. And look where it got me. I'm on the cross and Barabbas is free. If that ain't temptation, I don't know what is. Because we sit and choose the devil's path, except we end up on the cross and the devil is still going out doing his business. A tale that has already been told. So the thief realizes, you know what? Emma, either I'm going to follow Barabbas, who didn't say when he was free, hey, let me free, but release my friends too. Barabbas didn't say that. Barabbas said, sorry guys, I'm out. I'm so sorry that you're going to die. But I'm going to continue. You haven't died in vain. But he decides in his heart, I'm going to follow the man that's hanging with me. Who claimed to be the son of God. The Messiah. Who I heard Pilate say is innocent. And as he looks at him and he says to himself, I followed the wrong person. I chose the wrong path. And now as I'm breathing to death, and I'm finding it harder to stay alive, where am I going to put my faith in? Barabbas? No, he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me. And he tells the other thief, do you not fear God? We suffer justly, this man unjustly. And yet the thief is looking how Jesus takes and bears his cross. It's a tale that's already been told. We've all followed the wrong person at one time. We all followed the wrong path thinking this is where it would get us. Only to discover all too late. While suffering the consequences of our choice. They get off the hook. But you pay. You say, why did I ever follow this person in the first place? Why did I ever decide to smoke this thing? Why did I ever decide to date this girl? Why did I ever decide to go to this party? Why did I ever decide to watch this movie? I remember years ago at GYC, I came to go preach in the mornings. And a group of young people met me in the hallway. And they said, Brother Sebastian, we need you to call our friend. I said, well, I'm on my way to preach this morning. I, I really don't have time. They said, listen, he's demonically possessed. He was watching a horror movie. And all of a sudden, he just became possessed. And we called our pastor, and the pastor won't go over there. They're like, he's on the phone right now. Can you pray with him? So I got on the phone, prayed with him. I said, well, is there anyone else that can come over there? Is there anyone else that can meet there? They said, well, everyone's afraid to go there. And I said, that's so interesting. All people who will sing in church all hail the power of Jesus' name. But they won't even go to a man who's oppressed by the devil. Jesus didn't do that. So as we're going through this experience and the young people are thinking to themselves, you know what? After I got off the phone, all these times we thought watching these movies, doing this stuff, it was no big deal. Until we led our friend who followed us into watching this stuff. And say, yeah, instead of watching GYC tonight, I'm going to watch this horror film. Because my friends are like, yeah, this is what we should do. Yeah, it's a good movie. You should check it out. It's really scary. Now he's possessed of a demon. And your friends don't know what to do. Just like Barabbas can't do anything for you. And you realize all too late you followed the wrong person. A tale that has already been told. So this morning, the question is asked, were you there? I want to end with this quote, and then I have to let you go. It's talking about the hymn, 
Were you there when they crucified my Lord? It says, though the slaves were not allowed to read the scriptures, they learned Bible stories at the church on the plantation along with the white folks. The Sunday morning routine included Sunday school, singing hymns, Bible reading, the sermon where the preacher told them to obey the missus and the master. But the slaves also learned God's word from white and black abolitionist preachers from the north who traveled down to the southern states. After the Great Awakening, some southern whites who had come into the new light became Baptists. Much to the annoyance of many southerners, these new evangelicals began teaching the slaves about the way of salvation. A favorite analogy from the scriptures used by these preachers was the plight of the Hebrews of Exodus and God's handpicked leader Moses. The African slaves identified with this ancient oppressed people. They grew to understand that it was through their faith in the God of the Bible that freedom was given to these slaves of old. The Old Testament fired their imagination. Had not the people of Israel been enslaved in Egypt? And did not God rescue them, leading them out of bondage and into the promised land? Quickly they formed a kinship with Israel. Would not God do the same for them? In their enslavement. Moses became their man too. And figuratively they implored him in song. By singing the Negro spiritual. Go down Moses. Way down into Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh. Let my people go. You see the capacity. To funnel the trouble of their daily lives into song. Was the unique genius of the black slave. They were helped in this creation by their own preachers who identified with that congregation and what they had been through since the last week. They saw husbands sold away from wives, children separated from parents, women at the mercy of their master's lusts, and men at the end of their overseer's whip. Their environment with the lash and frequent use told them that they were in no way significant as persons, that they were only important as property. But as the slaves learned of the God of the Bible, they began to see themselves as his children. No, 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 the black preachers told them. You're not slaves. You are the apple of God's eye. Made in his very own image. They learned that it was through a good and benevolent God who heard the cry of the Hebrew slaves that freedom came. They realized that they were not inferior to the white men, just as the Hebrews were not inferior to the Egyptians. The spirituals attested to this and proclaimed the goodness of God. For a time, the slaves simply passed by the New Testament, especially since their white taskmasters used it to justify slavery. But there was something about the man Jesus hanging there, Upon the hard wooden cross. Here was a man who was beaten like they were. He was spit upon. He was falsely accused. He was imprisoned for a crime he did not commit. Finally, he was hung upon a tree. A method of execution familiar to the slaves. Through all these indignities, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How was he able to forgive, they questioned. What was it that enabled him to love those who were unlovable? Was he in pain? We are in pain. Did he have to drink the cup of suffering? We have to drink the cup of suffering. Yes, their cross was one with his cross. Jesus died for the sins of all men and of all colors. He had to be who he said he was. How else could he have done what he did? In time, they embraced Jesus as their savior, and they sang the song, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble. 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 Were you there? You were there. You were there. 
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray, Lord, that we would have begun to find our story in the story of the cross. As we begin to reflect upon Jesus' experiences and compare them to our own, we realize that our lives are tales, full of tales that have already been told. Lord, maybe there's someone here that says, I see my story in Jesus' story. I see my experiences. I see my failures. I see my own envy in Jesus' story. And Lord, my story is not a pretty one. It's not a beautiful one. But I pray that the one that wrote Jesus' story That he would rewrite mine today. That he would show me that there's healing. That there's forgiveness. That there's meaning. And all the things that I wish were never a part of my story. There's someone here that says that is my prayer today. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. You say, Lord, I need you to rewrite my story. This is what it has been. This is what my experience and my journey has been. But I need you to rewrite my story. It doesn't have to be the hatred. It doesn't have to be the envy. It doesn't have to be brotherly and sibling rivalry. It doesn't have to be following the wrong path. Jesus can write my story from here on out. If I decide to follow the right man. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts. And we trust that you'll continue to speak to us as we study your word in earnestness, in honesty, and in humility. In Jesus' name, amen. This message was recorded at the GYC 2014 conference at the Cross in Phoenix, Arizona. GYC, a supporting ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, seeks to inspire young people to be Bible-based, Christ-centered, and soul-winning Christians. To download or purchase other resources like this, visit us online at www.gycweb.org.